Final Fantasy is one of those franchises I have little to no experience in. Weird, right? As time goes on and I dive into more JRPGs, not having any experience with Final Fantasy always struck me as odd. It's arguably the JRPG franchise with the highest reputation, it's a pioneer in the genre, and it's a series people have so much love for. So what gives? How does someone who loves this genre so much miss a franchise as famous as Final Fantasy? I started to think it was a series I would just never get into. But that all changed in 2020 when Square Enix revealed the next mainline entry in their biggest IP. If it's the last thing I do, Final Fantasy 16 is one of the most, if not the most, divisive games to release in 2023 bar none. From the moment it was revealed, it was a vast departure from what fans were familiar with. No turn-based combat? No traditional party system? For Final Fantasy diehards, this was the worst possible outcome. Entries like Final Fantasy VII are so legendary because they are innovators of one of the most exciting genres in gaming. Games like Persona 5, for example, are created off the back of what Final Fantasy VII was able to accomplish. It's one of the most influential games in the industry, and for some, the most iconic video game of all time. There's a certain image people expect when it comes comes to Final Fantasy, and it's safe to say that 16 did not fit the profile fans were looking for. On the other hand, for newbies like me, this is exactly what I've been waiting for to finally jump in. I've always been a huge fan of creators being influenced by one another, and Final Fantasy 16 is one of those games where the director decided to go sicko mode, and craft something that's not only influenced by other media, but rivals and often surpasses those franchises it's taking inspiration from. And after dumping around 60 hours into it, I have quite a bit to say, because Final Fantasy 16 might just be one of the best video games ever made. For those of you still watching, bear with me. This is coming from a newcomer's perspective after all, so let me explain. I followed Final Fantasy 16's development really closely, especially as the launch got closer and closer. Besides just being inspired by other media, there were so many decisions made that would drastically shake the Final Fantasy formula up. These decisions were not made lightly. Square Enix was towing a very fine line. How could you craft something that you and the team want to make while at the same time not betraying longtime fans? Well, I guess we won't know until we start talking about it, right? Before that though, I really should explain my full history with Final Fantasy. I may not have played any tried and true mainline entries, but I'm not totally unfamiliar with Square's most famous franchise. When I was a kid, we had a policy in my house where if you got good grades, you'd get a new game. Obviously, my report cards were almost always good, so one day my mom took me to my local KB Toys and I started browsing their selection when one game grabbed my attention. Final Fantasy VII. The cover art instantly grabbed me and I looked at my mother and said, Mommy, mommy, I want that that one, the one with the big sword. When my mom went to go check it out, the, and I use this term very loosely, <clears throat> lovely attendant at KB Toys told my mom that this game was a bit too much for the spry six-year-old I was. So my mom decided to get me Toy Story 2. A fine game in its own right, but not at all what I was looking for. I probably attribute this singular moment as the main reason it took me as long as it did to get me into JRPGs. It wasn't until its 15th installment where I got my first taste of Final Fantasy and well, it certainly interesting thing, that's for sure. I won't sugarcoat it. I wasn't a huge fan. While the game looks beautiful and the story is quite interesting, the manner in which things are executed wasn't my cup of tea. And just as quickly as I started it, I put Final Fantasy 15 down. A shame, really. Golden Keys is one of the prettiest areas in video games. <laughs> There was still hope though. The long rumored Final Fantasy VII Remake finally got a release date, and during the time where most of us were in lockdown, there was no better time. And yeah, uh, it's certainly interesting, that's for sure. Okay, yeah, I get it. This is the remake for one of the greatest games ever made. I totally understand why for so many people, this is the culmination of the industry's work to celebrate the iconic Final Fantasy VII. But I'm sorry, this game is really boring. Square Enix has recently been plying their craft in what I like to call the movie game experience, where a video game for all intents and purposes looks, feels, and operates like a standard film. This style has many benefits. When it comes to presentation, very few games rival the amount of detail a game like Final Fantasy VII Remake has. So when it comes to presenting the story, more often than not, developers have a lot of wiggle room in how they want to tell the story. But this style does have its drawbacks, most notably with the gameplay. 
In a way to deter loading screens and to slow the game down, you'll have sections where you need to either walk slowly with a character as they explain story stuff that isn't really important, or crawl through a small crevice in your surroundings to reach the next area. In moderation, these are great for immersing the player into your game's world and can be used in a multitude of different ways. But in a game like Final Fantasy VII Remake where both of these things are thrown at you at almost every turn, it for lack of a better term, becomes annoying. Being advertised as an action remake of Final Fantasy VII, I want to mash buttons slay monsters, fight Sephiroth at the edge of existence. But no, I guess we'll just walk across the slums with Tifa. I'm sorry, that's Tifa showing me the slums at a snail's pace, and that's insulting to the snail. These moments ultimately take me out of the game rather than drawing me in because it drags things out. One would argue that since this is a remake, these changes were implemented in an attempt to expand the Final Fantasy VII experience. But I would argue that it hinders the experience rather than enhancing it. Plus, that's already been talked about. <laughs> Expanding, 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 expanding. This is all to say that it's pretty obvious that my background in the series is left wanting for sure. It's important to keep this in mind as we take a look at Final Fantasy 16, because your history with the franchise is going to heavily influence how you view this game. Now that the preamble is done, let's finally talk about today's game in question. I hope you're as excited as I am, because Final Fantasy 16 took Square Enix to the peak, or I guess back to the peak. The story of Final Fantasy XVI takes place in the realm of Valisthea, home to six kingdoms, the Grand Duchy of Rosaria, the Crystalline Dominion, the Holy Empire of Sambrek, the Dalmechian Empire, the Kingdom of Walud, and the Iron Kingdom. The realm of Valisthea also houses the blessing known as the Mother Crystals. These crystals form around the six major kingdoms. Their purpose upon their inception was to bless the citizens of Valisthea with the gift of magic through the power of Aether. This power also bestowed the gift of the Icons, specialized titans of Valisthea lore held and manifested by unique individuals. However, a terrible infection known as the Blight starts to infect all the living beings of Valisthea. On top of the Blight, the realm itself is in shambles, kingdoms waging war against each other for dominance of whatever land hasn't been infected. The citizens of Valisthea are separated into three major categories. You have your high-class royalty figures like your dukes and emperors and all that, your common folk that either enlist in the military or open shops to sell goods, and finally the bearers, those blessed with the the gift of magic, but enslaved by those in higher status. Some kingdoms like Rosaria stand against the status quo and actively work to end the enslavement of bearers. However, most people look at bearers as the lowest of the low. No exaggeration, some of the things these people say about bearers is truly awful. That fucking snake played me false, acted like he was one of us, and the old time he was one of them. We need him caught and handed over to the Imperials. Hanging's too good for him. Well, go on then. If he gets away, I'll see you fitted for a noose. For this journey, we step into the shoes of Clive Rossfield, firstborn son of the Archduke of Rosaria. Clive was supposed to inherit the Icon of Fire's power and inherit the throne from his father. However, he was not born with the Phoenix's blessing. Due to this fact, Clive is looked down upon by pretty much everyone. He's looked at as a failure for not producing the Phoenix's blessing. It's actually Clive's younger brother Joshua who inherited the power of the Phoenix and Clive acts as his shield, or for those confused, a guardian. Although Clive isn't the one to hold the Phoenix's power, he holds no resentment towards his younger brother and strives to be the best shield he can be. Clive is supported by his best friend Jill Warwick and his wolf Torgal. They say the bond between a wolf and his master is not easily broken. Elwyn Rossfield, the Duke of Rosaria, learns that the Iron kingdom intends to make a move against Rosaria, so to prepare for the upcoming battle, he takes Joshua to Phoenix Gate to perform the Rosarian Ceremony of the Phoenix. This ceremony never occurs, however, as Phoenix Gate is invaded by the Holy Empire of Sambrek. Elwyn is beheaded, Joshua transforms into the Phoenix, ah! and shockingly, a new Icon of Fire appears. The Phoenix and second Icon of Fire battle sees the Phoenix seemingly murdered, as Clive can only look on in horror. I'll kill you! I'll fucking kill 
Oh, yeah. A few hours pass and the Sambrekian troops are killing off those left of the Rosarian forces. It's revealed that Annabella, Clive and Joshua's mother, betrayed her husband and handed the Rosarian Empire to Sambrek on a platter. See, Annabella is one of those extreme people who hates bears and can't stand the fact Clive couldn't inherit the phoenix. She's big on status and heritage, so she views Clive as a massive failure. And since Elwyn wanted to help the bearers, she felt like their family name was being thrown around in the mud. To Annabella, her status is more important to her than her own family. So understandably, she's upset to learn the second icon of fire killed her prized possession. Annabella decides to spare Clive and enlist him in the service as a bearer, just adding insult to injury. And it's here where Final Fantasy 16 truly starts. Yeah, I know that was a really, really, really long intro, but it's important to give the context early on regarding the state of affairs in the realm and the early key players and their motivations. This story is divided into three major sections. Clive when he's a teenager, Clive when he's a young man, and Clive when he's a seasoned vet. To keep up with what goes on before these time skips, the story needs to go into detail early on to hook you in. And boy, does it do an exceptional job at grabbing the player. The political intrigue, the mystique around the icons and the crystals, and the characters you meet are all executed in a manner that's very digestible. Remember those decisions I was talking about earlier? This first section is a perfect example of what I mean. Leading up to the release of Final Fantasy 16, a lot of details on the game development were shared with the press. It usually had to do with how they got ideas for the game, but nonetheless details that provide a lot of context while you're playing the game. One of the main inspirations is the portrayal of fantasy from creators in the West. Game of Thrones is one of the most culturally significant shows to ever release, for better and for worse. Lead producer of Creative Business Unit 3, Naoki Yoshida, better known as Yoshi P, says that around the start of Final Fantasy 16's development, the fourth season of Game of Thrones was on the air. After seeing the wave of fandom Game of Thrones was able to cultivate, Yoshi P bought the first four seasons of Game of Thrones and made his team watch it. Jesus Christ. I mean, to be fair, the first four seasons of Game of Thrones are the only good parts of the show, but it's such a far departure from traditional Final Fantasy. This epic is preceded by a story about environmentalism and the effect greed has on the world, and a story where your main mode of transportation is a fucking Mercedes. It's just so different, you know? Final Fantasy is one of those franchises that constantly takes elements from previous entries and iterates and hypothetically improves them as each entry releases. Final Fantasy 16 feels like the complete opposite. It seems angry at what Final Fantasy was, and wants to smash it into the ground to create something entirely new. If I'm being honest though, this is exactly what I wanted. Sure, some cashier at an old toy store may have shafted me from playing Final Fantasy as a kid, but it took until this game for me to appreciate what the series has to offer. It was that shift in tone, being inspired by media that shifted how entertainment is crafted, and changing gameplay direction that really sold me on the idea of this new vision Square has for Final Fantasy. And all that starts with the combat, because dude, Dude, the combat in Final Fantasy 16 is next level good, crazy good. Rather than having turn-based combat or faux action like say Final Fantasy 7 Remake, Final Fantasy 16 leaves all the turns behind and goes all in on the high octane mayhem of true action combat. Final Fantasy is famous for pioneering how turn-based combat functions today at a fundamental level. Similar to how a lot of open world games look to Ocarina of Time, a lot of developers often reference Final Fantasy 7 as a huge development tool in crafting turn-based combat systems. If you look back and want to get really technical, the shift probably started around Final Fantasy 13. But to me, the developers of Final Fantasy took the first major step in Final Fantasy 15. Yeah, the combat is as simple as being next to an enemy and holding a button, but making it all real time was the first big step into the action genre. I don't really have anything else positive to say about Final Fantasy 15 from a gameplay point of view, so I'm just gonna move on. Final Fantasy 16 on its surface feels like a pretty generic and simple action game. You mash the attack button a bunch and have certain abilities locked to certain controller commands. Deal as much damage to whittle your opponent's health bar down to zero as quickly and efficiently as possible. I totally get longtime fans feeling frustrated with this new system. It's less long-term planning to achieve an inevitable goal with the satisfaction coming from seeing the plan come together, and more focused on quick reaction-based decision-making where the satisfaction is executing a sick-ass combo to delete your foe. This change was made to broaden the player base since the turn-based combat, while beloved, wasn't always the easiest barrier to entry. From a die-hard perspective, I totally understand, even if I'm not a longtime fan of Final Fantasy. Let me explain. A lot of people dislike Persona 5 because a lot of the die 
diehards feel like it betrayed what made its predecessors like Persona 3 so special. The addition of more heartwarming and cringe teen drama scenes are the main reason. Fans say, Why do I have to have a hot tub scene in my Persona game? This isn't my Persona. I've never been one for this type of discourse at the fundamental level. I'm totally open to any of my favorite franchises making changes that make sense in context to the game. Will the changes always land? Not necessarily, but that doesn't mean it's not worth giving a shot, and the shift to a more action-styled combat is a change that ultimately worked out for the best. Final Fantasy XVI's action combat, by all accounts, rivals its contemporaries as one of the best action games of all time. I can't really make it simpler than that. Fighting just about anything in this game is just hype as fuck. A name you might not be familiar with but is vital to the combat of Final Fantasy XVI is Ryota Suzuki. He's nobody, just one of the combat designers of Devil May Cry 5, one of the greatest if not the greatest action game of all time. Yeah, Square brought the big guns in for their first true action game and with Suzuki calling Final Fantasy XVI his magnum opus, or his own personal masterpiece, you just know that this is gonna be good. So in what manner do we take down our enemies? Clive has two main ways to dish out punishment against his adversaries. He has his trusty sword, and the magic he's blessed with. The sword is very simple. Slash slash slash, whack 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 your enemy until they die. Where the fun comes in is tying your sword skills with your magic. At any given point, Clive can flex his spell casting skills in tandem with his sword slashes to deal devastating damage to your foe. After spending some time to figure out how everything works, trying every possible combo I could is where I realized the brilliance of these mechanics. Something that makes action games unique is how each player interprets the mechanics laid before them. Really good games in this genre are masters at giving the player a wide variety of moves and letting you go to your heart's content. You, the player, craft how the action feels using the moves you want to use. It's like painting a picture. You can ask a hundred different artists to paint the same thing, but each of them will paint it differently. Final Fantasy 16 excels in this regard. Dude, there's just so many options. So many different ways to mow down your enemies. It's honestly overwhelming. It also helps that these moves are all incredibly stylish. Not only do they deal out massive damage, but man, you can absolutely style on your enemy, adding insult to injury as you thwack them to their doom. Tying it all together is just how smooth everything feels. Final Fantasy 16 is one of those current gen games that has both a fidelity and performance mode. Since I've never been one to count the hairs on characters' heads anyways, I naturally went with the performance mode. While exploring the world, the game can kind of chug when it comes to the frame rate, but as soon as you enter a battle, it settles down and hits the intended 60 frames a second, most of the time. Of course I would prefer something faster, but 60 frames a second is the perfect compromise when it comes to combat. Since everything feels so smooth, linking your attacks is seamless and the challenge becomes continuing that combo until the fight is over. You're not constantly chasing that combo just for damage though. You as the player want to continue that high you get when you pull off a sick ass combo to end a tough fight. This is the backbone of Final Fantasy 16's combat. Every action game to date has had some sort of gimmick that ties everything together. Bayonetta with Witch Time, Devil May Cry with Devil Trigger, you get it. Final Fantasy 16's gimmick is the icon abilities you get as you attune with more of them. Spoiler ahead, but you should already know that, there's eight different icons Clive will attune with over the course of the game. This attunement means he gets a limited amount of that specific icon's power. The icon abilities are special moves that... <sighs> Look, I'm just gonna be honest. These things are the coolest fucking things in the world. Look at how sick this is. Look at all the colors. Ah! <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's just that I don't really have the technical terms to really explain how awesome these abilities are. They're skills designed to wow you, and that's exactly what they do. Are the icon abilities the deepest mechanics in an action game? No, certainly not. But just look at this sequence and you tell me this isn't the hypest shit you've ever seen. It doesn't hurt that you have so many options when it comes to the icons you want to choose. Like I said earlier, you'll get access to 8 different icons, and each offer a different set of moves that distinguish them from one another. Okay, that sounds really boring. Let me explain this a little better. Each icon is tied to a specific element, so Ifrit is tied to fire, Garuda is tied to wind, Ramu is tied to lightning, you get it. It's going to be up to you to decide which icon is best for your playstyle. 
Personally speaking, I like to mix things up, so to speak. It would be extremely boring and exhausting to break down each individual Titan, so let's approach this from a different angle. I have an insatiable need to mash the attack button as fast as possible, but if I'm up against an enemy who's stronger than me, I like to slow things down and utilize some of my slower moves that deal more damage. So the icons I primarily used fit my playstyle perfectly. If I'm fighting against an enemy where I can have free reign to attack as fast as I want, I'll use the Phoenix. I can use the Phoenix dash to close the gap. I can use one of Ifrit's abilities to close the gap. Basically, if I want to be as close as I possibly can for the duration of the fight, I'll equip the Phoenix. Plus, his ultimate ability is a giant screen nuke that clears all the enemies in the arena. Can't really ask for much more, can I? But let's say I want to clear the crowd quickly while the Phoenix's ultimate is recharging. Well, I'll switch over to Odin and whip out Odin's blade. I'll gather all the enemies as I slash them to their peril. And when this meter hits 5, I'll unleash the Zantetsuken to just delete my foes from their existence. Yes, use the power of the Bankai from hit anime series Bleach to eviscerate your adversaries where they stand. I don't know if that's how it works. Sorry. Now I'd say I'm pretty good at this Final Fantasy game, so the enemies didn't really pose a challenge to me. But for the sake of argument, let's just say there was an enemy I could have some trouble with. Well in that case, I'll switch over to Bahamut and charge up my Ligma Flare to bring these supposed stronger enemies to their knees. And when shit hits the fan, it's nice to know that Bahamut has access to his very own Kamehameha. You see what I'm getting at, right? These are just a few potential strategies with a few of the icons you have access to. Really, if you do the math, the possibilities are endless. Combined with the fact when you master an ability on the skill tree, you can mix and match abilities with whichever icon you want. So as an example, I really like this ability Ramu has called Pile Drive. Basically, Cloud just smashes the ground with a lightning attack and it does a lot of damage. And while I think it's really cool there's a dedicated shot lock tied to Ramu, I don't really like using that ability all too much. I just like having my anime energy blast. So I'll just master the pile drive ability since I really like using it and equip it when I choose Bahamut. It's so simple yet so perfect. This single feature fully allows the player to choose exactly how they want to play. You can essentially choose how fast or slow you want to go. Really like matching buttons and extending your combo for as long as possible? There's an icon for that. Prefer using skills that are focused on charging and unleashing massive amounts of damage all at once? There's an icon for that. Want to see pretty colors flash as you devastate your foe's life force? Yes, there is in fact an icon for that. Versatility is the best word to describe it, and it all leads to the hypest combat system I've ever experienced in a video game. Sure, it's not the deepest combat system when you're linking 5 to 10 different skills as you engage your enemy, but when it looks this good, does it really even matter? When you're in perfect sync, nailing every perfect dodge, slashing your opponent at will, and perfectly timing the use of your icon abilities, it becomes action game nirvana. That is no exaggeration. The core gameplay excels at the technical level, which in turn allows it to shoulder the load of the combat, while the icon abilities excel at the visual level, wowing the player and constantly urging you to mix them into your combos just to get that visual stimulation the icon skills pack. It makes for such a tight, challenging, entertaining, and overall excellent combat system. But something doesn't feel right. It feels like there's just something missing. This combat is dope, truly excellent stuff but I'm not really feeling the Final Fantasy-ness in it. You know what I mean? Hey, what's that weird bar that's glowing under my health? Holy shit! Yeah, this is how Final Fantasy 16 interprets the limit break, essentially letting Clive power up to Super Saiyan before unleashing a barrage of attacks to decimate your foe. I almost want to say that this is a bit extra and a little forced, but I'm just so easy to please. I think this is so sick. I just can't get over how hype Final Fantasy 16 gets with its combat. And Limit Break is just icing on the cake. Similar to the icon abilities, I'd ask if the Limit Break is the deepest mechanic or if it's even necessary, but it ramps the fight up at any given moment. It doesn't matter when you whip it out. You'll feel some sort of reaction when you input that Limit Break command and Clive goes Titan mode. The screen gets all fiery. The music ramps up. Each hit feels like you're slamming your opponent. For how insane this game can look at points visually, the limit break is just another string in your bow all things considered. I honestly saved this move for when I really needed it, which admittedly wasn't all that much until the end. But hey, it's still cool, and it's called limit break so it pays homage to Final Fantasy and all that, so that's nice. The last thing I'd regret not mentioning are the enemies you are constantly destroying as you engage in the combat, because dude, these things are just so cool. 
Sure, most of them are pretty by the books. Oh no, look, it's a wolf. Ah, I'm scared. Look out, it's a plant. Mm. Ah, watch out, it's the Blue Man Group. I'm blue, I'm what I really mean to praise are the unique monster designs because these are truly special. You'll see these as you progress in the story and if you partake in the optional hunt challenges, which is where the real meat of the combat comes from. Every single one of these unique fights are epic. At no point do these ever fail in delivering that over-the-top, grandiose battle you expect when you make that slow walk to each of them. The bosses themselves are all just so cool looking. You could be fighting a regular knight or a fucking dragon. It doesn't matter, they all just look so sick. Combined with the fact that these all present quite the challenge, these boss fights are when the combat system reaches its peak. You have to combine everything you've learned, every experience you've garnered to that point, and put it all together in a challenging one-on-one -on -one anime duel. I mean, just look at how this boss enters the fight. We should head back. It's just, ah, it's just so good. I want to tell you where it really hit me that this game is goaded. Like, no joke, I can actually remember this specific moment. I was in between story missions, and I had to take care of some hunt requests. I was level 38 at the time, I believe. I had an S-rate challenge on the board, and it got my eyes glistening. So I made the trek over, and I found the scariest dragon to ever dragon Svarog waiting for me. He was level 50, and I was level 38. Clearly, I was at a severe disadvantage, and to say that I got bodied my first attempt would be the understatement of the century. Now, seeing as I have a life outside of this YouTube thing, I knew if I didn't take it down now, I probably wasn't coming back, so I took a few minutes to devise a strategy, and I went back in. My second attempt is not only where it all came together, but where the game reached a level only a certain few reach. I was locked in, nailing nearly all of my dodges, timing my special abilities perfectly. I was on point. I was executing on everything, and eventually, after almost 20 minutes of fighting, I stood tall over Svarog, and all I could do was utter a sigh of relief. The thought that entered my mind was simple, but it had quite the effect on me. Final Fantasy 16 is the best action game of all time. Yeah, 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 I get it. What do I know about Final Fantasy? Shit, what the hell do I know about action games, right? All the noise aside, really think about it for a second. I neglected to mention all the other things in the combat like Torgal, your loyal wolf companion that you have control over in combat, or how you can ride a chocobo whenever you damn well please with your loyal steed Ambrosia, or the side quests which get you access to the ultimate weapon, or the world, or any of that stuff because really, this game is entirely focused around the combat system. Every side quest leads into combat. The world is design always leads you into combat. Everything in Final Fantasy 16, yes, including the story, revolves around the combat system. So it was imperative not only for the developers, but for me to highlight just how good this combat system is. Because it is truly something beyond special. It takes special, smashes it into the ground, and rises above to ascend that level only a few games do. The peak. Fitting for Clav's personality, if you're looking at it technically, it runs smooth, every hit is satisfying to land, every attack is viable, and you'll constantly be using everything in your repertoire in every single fight. And visually, I mean, come on, just look at it. Need I say more? One thing I have neglected to mention is the music, because oh man, the music in Final Fantasy 16 is up there with some of the best music I've ever heard. Masayoshi Soken was the main composer for Final Fantasy 16, and this man held nothing back. Once again, I go back to Game of Thrones, because, I mean, come on, the soundtrack is not hiding how epic it wants to sound. At no moment does the music not get your blood pumping before a fight. It sounds like it's egging you on to get into battle. At the same time, it's not afraid to slow down and remind you that even amongst all the chaos, it's okay to cherish the moments with those you care about.
I could tell a little story for almost every song in the game, but it's safe to say that Soken nailed it with the music in Final Fantasy 16. I had never really heard any of his music before this, and I was blown away. To this day, I still catch myself humming the beginning of the main battle thing. <laughs> So the music's really, really good. I'd be so disappointed if it isn't nominated at the Game Awards, but that's besides the point. I mentioned earlier that Suzuki said in the lead-up to Final Fantasy XVI's release that he regarded Final Fantasy XVI's combat as his magnum opus, and really, it shows. Square Enix pulled all the stops. They brought all hands on deck to support Suzuki's vision. Platinum Games? Yup, they worked on the combat. The studio behind Kingdom Hearts 4? Where do you think that shot lock came from? All being led by one of the designers from DM C5. It was just destined to be great, and even then, it exceeds that. Bayonetta, Devil May Cry, Kingdom Hearts, and even No More Heroes? These are just a few games I can instantly recognize as games that Final Fantasy 16 is influenced by, but somehow it takes all those games and combines them to craft a combat system that exceeds most, if not all, of those titles. It's just so good. I've shelled it enough. I've given it its flowers. It's good. Really good. And while Final Fantasy 16 may have arguably the best combat system in the genre, once again, I have to turn back to the Final Fantasy of it all. It's no secret Final Fantasy has been moving towards the action genre for a while now. Final Fantasy 15 and Final Fantasy 7 Remake both, for all intents and purposes, function as action games. Yeah, they have their own quirks, but if you put enough time into each of them, they won't feel too much different than Final Fantasy 16. Even if they are action games, though, both are able to still feel like traditional Final Fantasy, where 16 does everything it can to differentiate itself from traditional Final Fantasy combat. So even if I really like it, saying that it's the greatest action game of all time might not be enough to convince you of what I believe. So what about the story? This is the other key aspect of Final Fantasy 16 that has people mixed on the changes Square Enix decided to make. See, a huge reason people love Final Fantasy so much is because of the story and characters that accompany you on your journey. Final Fantasy is one of the pioneers of the JRPG genre, which means these games aren't exactly short. So eventually, Square Enix figured out if you were going to be spending so much time in this world, the story and character should make that time worth it. People love Cloud, Tifa, Aerith, Barret, and the narrative of Final Fantasy VII. It's one of the huge aspects of that game that makes it so legendary. And Square Enix was not shy in the pre-release leading up to Final Fantasy XVI, because they revealed how different everything was going to be from the very start. With that in mind, can the story of Final Fantasy XVI match the level of the combat system I think is first class? Last chance on spoilers, don't say I didn't warn you. It is no secret that the world and story of Final Fantasy XVI were quote unquote influenced by a lot of Western media, and they're not even hiding it. Game of Thrones, the iconic HBO original adapted from George R. R. Martin's works that took the Dungeons and Dragons fantasy element and made it sexy. I mean epic, it was it was really, really epic. While Gaut is very culturally significant and a huge inspiration for the world and story of Final Fantasy, the references don't stop there. As I mentioned previously, this story takes place over the span of Clive Rossfield's life, and ironically enough, I found the references to be structured similarly. Before I get into the nitty gritty and give my thoughts like I normally would, I want to lay out this structure. It'll be relevant as I go on throughout the video. When Clive is a teen and a young adult, the story is structured and feels like the first four seasons of Game of Thrones. That political intrigue, the faraway thought of the blight creeping in every second of every day, it all very closely resembles the first four seasons of Game of Thrones. You don't really know what everyone's thinking. Everyone has a lot of different motives. Remember those characters from the trailer that were played off to be really important? What if I told you they don't make it past the fourth hour of the game? Just things like that. It all just makes it feel Game of Thronesy in a general sense. And yes, from a general sense. There's obviously way more that influences Final Fantasy. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm just being generic. Relax, YouTube commenter. Valisthea, in terms of scale and scope, is very reminiscent of Westeros. And hell, even the map looks like the intro sequence from Game of Thrones. I mean, it's just very clear Game of Thrones played a huge role to Yoshi P and the rest of the team. On the flip side, the fully adult Clive portion of the game feels more like Netflix's The Witcher. Like, yeah, it feels like the game too, but I'm coming off a binge from the TV show, so my head immediately goes there. This is more reminiscent in terms of the characters and the story 
story rather than the world, so I'll go into it later. Even the monsters you fight all for the most part feel ripped straight out of The Witcher. The Morgul boss fight when Clive's the teen feels like Yoshi P watched the opening sequence of season 1 and was like, yeah, do that. Not to say that there isn't any Final Fantasy elements in the world or the characters and all that. I already mentioned chocobos, but there's so much more that we're going to get into. So now that we have a basic foundation of what's going on in the tale of Final Fantasy 16, let's get more into it. After the massacre at Phoenix Gate, we flash forward 13 years and Clive, now scarred with the mark of the bearer, intersects a battle between the Dalmex and Iron Kingdom where he sees both Shiva, the icon of ice, and Titan, the icon of earth, battling one another. Where they just cause an obscene amount of damage. After waking up from the aftermath, Clive and his band of rebels find the person holding Shiva's power. But as Clive gets closer, he realizes that this is his long lost friend, Joe Warwick. One of his companions orders Clive to kill Shiva as they were ordered by the Queen of Sembrek personally. Upon seeing Jill, Clive remembers his true self and battles his companion to the death. Once the battle is over, Jill wakes up briefly and another familiar figure appears as Clive tends to Jill. A fully grown up Torgal along with a man who calls himself Sid appear to offer Clive a choice. After an initial betting in period and with the help of Torgal, Sid is able to convince Clive and Jill to join his cause. See, Sid is a bit of a freedom fighter. He wants to change the state of the world due to the oppression of bearers. He believes that everyone should be judged on a scale of merit and ability rather than your status. Your bloodline doesn't matter, how you can help each other does. While Clive is hesitant at first, he believes that Sid's cause is a just one and commits himself wholeheartedly to Sid and his mission. And pretty much that's how it goes until the next major time skip. Things do happen, but everything here is focused on developing the characters rather than advancing the main plot. That happens much later. So let's quick fire everything that happens here and talk about the icon fights because I don't care how long this video needs to be, I will not forget to talk about those. The first big pillar in this arc is Sid and his mission to create equality for all. The main portion focusing on how he and his supporters will accomplish this. As I mentioned earlier, Valisthea is home to the Mother Crystals across the Six Kingdoms. The Mother Crystals grant a great gift, but at the cost of a terrible price. Coming in contact with the crystal for a moment will grant the bearer the gift of magic, but the abuse of this power will eventually cause the bearers to fall under the magic's curse, which causes the bearer's body to decay. The mother crystals, also due to their massive size and power, leak ether, the main source of power across Valisthea, which in mass is the main cause of the blight. Basically, Sid believes if they destroy the mother crystals, then everyone who has magic will lose it, therefore making everyone equal. Sid is the perfect character for this role. Over the course of this arc, Sid acts as the perfect mentor for a young and broken Clive. As Clive tries to find himself, it's comforting knowing he has Sid to rely on. He teaches Clive what it means to be vulnerable in a sense. He teaches him how to be selfless, and most importantly, how to lead. As the wielder of Ramu, the icon of lightning, he embodies his noble traits all the way up until his untimely death where he eventually leaves his mission with Clive. But that's jumping the gun a bit. Moving on, we have our villains of the arc. Combining the two of them will save some time. First, Benedicta Harmon, the wielder of Garuda, the icon of wind. Benedicta is currently serving as the head of covert ops for Barnabas the King of Walud. However, she shares a close personal history with Sid. As she came into power in Walud, Sid also rose to power and served as the King's Lord Commander. Wow, not even trying to be subtle, are we? While Benedicta is a smart, confident, sexy woman who doesn't hide her power, she is clearly broken in more ways than one. Every interaction she has with Sid, you can just see her lose more and more of her sanity. While she tells herself that she's free to do as she wishes, she knows deep down that she's a slave for Barnabas and nothing more. This culminates in the first official icon fight of the game. And man, these are something special. These are purely made for spectacle. At no point are these a substitute for the main combat. They are made to supplement the main combat. Let me explain. When Yoshi P spoke on the game before its release, he mentioned that they specifically chose the PS5 due to the SSD integration Sony crafted with their next-gen hardware. Since I'm not an idiot and I know that translates to, Sony paid us a lot of money to make this game. <laughs> All for the sake of the video take his word on it. Let's just say Yoshi P isn't lying through his teeth and we take his words at face value. The icon fights are pretty much the only shred of evidence I can come up with for this statement to hold any water. They are truly epic. They look hype as shit. The music is always on point. It's just perfect. Controlling Ifrit is essentially controlling a supersized version of Clive. Sure, you're missing the versatility of all the other icons, but goddamn, when it looks this good, it does not matter. The game even shamelessly, no, 
Not even that. It proudly includes quick time events in these icon battles. And normally, I'd be really critical with something like this. But for Final Fantasy 16, a game focused on presenting the greatest spectacle in a video game, the Final Fantasy, if you will, I wouldn't have these any other way. Like I did with the combat, I'll do the same here. Just look at it. I'm having my own attack on Titan fight across these beautiful landscapes, listening to banger music. Like even if I wanted anything else, I wouldn't even possibly know where to start. You're meant to feel like a badass, and you do feel like a badass. Simply put, it's euphoric. I'll talk more about these as we go on, but is there anything else here? Oh, Benedicta. She used to hook up with Sid or whatever, and currently she's hooking up with the Emperor of the Dalmachian Empire, Hugo Kupka. There isn't really much to say. He is just really, really in love with Benedicta. That's like the extent of his character. I don't even know his purpose in the grand scheme of things. All I know is he has one of the hypest boss fights in the game. Yeah, it's really hard to top this. Fighting Titan in a multi-phase boss fight across the entirety of this vast land while he's hurling these rock arms like he's in the upper ranks from Demon Slayer, all accompanied with the best track in the entire game? Ugh, I just can't. That's about it with Kuka. Simple and clean. Hey, look at that, another Kingdom Hearts reference. What else, what else? Oh, before we get to Clive, we of course have Jill Warwick, who's just the best. I don't know how else to say this, but I love Jill. She's my favorite female character in any video game. She just has everything I'm looking for. She's caring, but confident. Sassy, but sweet. And no matter what, she always has her friends back. And really, can you ask for much more than that? It's her struggle that I personally enjoy so much. While she was separated from Clive, she discovered she held the dominant Shiva. When she discovered her power, she got captured by the Iron Kingdom and was enslaved due to her ability. For 13 years, she endured suffering unbeknownst to most, and certainly more than anyone should have to go through. During this time period, she's able to avenge the ally she made during her enslavement and finally put an end to the suffering she went through for anyone else held captive. Jill is usually all about helping Clive achieve what he needs to do. During this time period, he's mainly focused on finding the one that killed Joshua. But when the time comes to destroy the Mother Crystal and the Iron Kingdom, the story fully focuses on Jill. In watching her finally come to terms with everything she suffered, and seeing her overcome all the obstacles to finally stick it to the man who's caused her so much pain, is one of the most satisfying moments ever. The crystal. What did you do to it? Oh, we destroyed it. What? What? Monster! Monster! Do you have any idea what you have done? I do, Father. I have killed the monster and become an outlaw! May the blessing of the crystals go with you. Jill is just fantastic. She's equal parts adorable and savage, a combo not easily achieved, and she just makes going through the adventure so much better. At times during her arc in the story, I felt as though I was rushing through things so I could help her overcome this trauma. I felt such a connection with Jill. That should speak for itself. And finally, we have Clive. As I mentioned a second ago, his main focus while helping Sid destroy the Mother Crystals is finding the man that killed Joshua. Before he lost consciousness at Phoenix Gate, he saw a man in a hood who he believes is the man responsible for Joshua was death. In actuality, it was Clive himself. 
Wow, shocker, Clive is the second dominant of fire. I totally didn't spoil that earlier. Yup, Clive has the power of Ifri, the dominant of fire. And this arc mainly follows him coming to terms with the idea of him being Ifri, because if that's the case, it would mean that Clive killed his own brother. It's in these moments where Clive really shines. Clive is dealing with some pretty heavy shit. He thinks he killed his brother. He holds the power of a dominant long thought lost. In the midst of trying to cure the world of the blight, my man has a lot going on. It's interesting to see Clive develop in this arc, but really, he's much more focused in the final arc of the game. Really, all you need to know with Clive right now is that he's got an icon, and while he believes his brother is dead, that is unsurprisingly not the case. Joshua Rossfield is actually alive and kicking. That's right, baby. Plot twist. The reason Joshua is alive is because he's investigating the true enemy of Final Fantasy 16, Ultima. This perfectly sets up the final arc of Final Fantasy 16. Bear with me just a bit longer, because here's where the fun begins. While the game's marketing will lead you to believe Barnabas is the main bad guy, it's actually Ultima who's Final Fantasy XVI's true antagonist, but I'm getting a tad ahead of myself. After all, we haven't even talked about Joshua yet. After the events of Phoenix Gate, Joshua was found by members of the Undying, the secret society in charge of chronicling the lives of the Rossfield family. It's during the 13 years Joshua is missing where he starts to learn about the real enemy. The last boss before the final time skip is actually a teaser of what's to come, and while it's unbelievably hype, this video is already really long, so I really should move on. As Clive goes on his little murder tour across Valisthea, he eventually finds himself needing to destroy the Mother Crystal at Saint Breck, home to the Icon of Light, Dion Lesage, and of course Mama Rossfield herself, Annabella. Currently, Dion believes that Annabella, his stepmother, is actively working against the Empire as the Emperor himself cedes his power onto Dion's half-brother Oliver. Joshua met with Dion previously to warn him about Ultima's influence, and it's when Oliver becomes the leader of Sam Breck, where Ultima reveals that he's been in control the entire time. I know that's a lot to take in, but if we're being honest, that's kinda how the game presents all of this. It really just wants to get to that big icon fight, and I can see why. The boss fight with Bahamut is straight up a love letter to Shonen anime. It's a dragon fighting another dragon, but I mean just look at it. Look at this shot right here and tell me this isn't ripped straight out of Dragon Ball Z. Moving on, after kicking Dion's ass with the help of Joshua, Clive and his brother have a short-lived reunion with their mother until she sees her fake son evaporate where she then decides that this is all too much to handle. It's at this point in the story where we spend the remainder of our time fleshing out the final conflict while simultaneously telling the final stories for our main cast, which at this point consists of Clive, Joshua, Jill, and Dion. I already gushed about Jill, and I'm saving Clive for last, so let's talk about the other two real quick. Dion Lesage is the classic lone wolf personality character. He isolates himself from those he loves because he believes with the power of Bahamut, he can shoulder the load alone. Similar to Clive in that sense, when he decides to overthrow the new emperor, he has no hesitation, even though he knows he will not only destroy his home, but kill many of the citizens he swore to protect. Watching him go from hot-headed antagonist to broken yet willing sidekick feels genuine because at the end of the day, Dion just wants to do what's right. It fits his entire character. 
he's willing to take the shame of destroying the kingdom he's supposed to fight for in his stride because he knows it will lead to the greater good. Fuck, this guy kills his own dad at one point. He's hardcore as fuck. If any of this sounds familiar, it's because Dion is almost a perfect representation of Jamie Lannister, minus the whole incest thing. If you're familiar with Jamie Lannister, you'll understand that his entire character revolves around events that take place before the story begins. He destroyed his entire reputation to protect all the people of Westeros, and he spends the rest of his days atoning for this heroic deed. Dion's life isn't nearly as miserable, but from the very get-go, you can just tell that the vibe is the same. All in all, Dion is great. Joshua Rossfield, the dominant of the Phoenix and Crown Prince of the House of Rosaria, is a character I am quite fond of. As someone who has siblings, I really like Joshua. One of my favorite scenes in the game is when he and Clive reunite. Speaking from Clive's perspective, it's just finally good to see this guy finally win one. Because damn does this story get miserable at points. And from Joshua's perspective, this guy has been plotting on the side for pretty much the entire story. It's really not until the end where we get to see Joshua and Clive spend genuine in time together. So to see all his work be rewarded with the reunion both of these characters have been chasing after the entire runtime of this game is just so heartwarming. Seriously, I tear up every time I watch this back. Joshua is just a really good character to bounce off of. He has really good chemistry with the rest of the cast, and I really like him. If I'm reaching, I'd say that he's going for the whole Bran Stark post three-eyed raven thing. Unlike Bran though, Joshua is a well-written character, so he actually has personality and charm and things like that. Last but not least, we have our protagonist, Clive Rossfield, dominant of Ifrit, Sid the second, shield to Joshua, Mythos himself. I'm going to combine Clive and Ultima together because as you learn in the story, their fates are intertwined. Clive is what I would define as the perfect quote unquote broken protagonist. I know that doesn't make much sense so let me elaborate. If Sora from Kingdom Hearts is the definition of a protagonist who represents pure good, Clive is his polar opposite in the sense that he's chaotic good. Clive is not afraid to cross certain lines to achieve his goal. Look at him talk shit to Kupka as he brags that it was he who killed Benedicta and not Sid. So for are my own. Sid did everything in his power to save that woman, though she was long past saving. And so I did what he couldn't. It was me all along, Hugo. It was... you. You... you killed her. Cause I'm super hot, boy! Oh! <laughs> Clive is the type of guy who doesn't have time for any sort of pettiness unless it's for those he really cares about. When it comes to his brother Joshua, his best friend Jill, or his loyal partner Torgal, Clive always goes out of his way to help them whenever they need him. Because at the end of the day, after all he's been through, for the task that awaits him, all that really matters are the people you love. This leads to Clive finally getting to have the relationship with Joshua he's always dreamed of, not as his shield, but as his brother, as well as cultivating a relationship for the one true love in his life. I know I should be spending the little time we have left talking about Clive and his struggle with Ultima, or how he reminds me of Geralt from The Witcher when he takes on the name Sid II, but my favorite part in the entire game is when Clive and Jill admit their love to one another. By this point in the game, Clive has done more than enough to earn this moment. Sure, there's still a terrifying threat awaiting, but after saving almost all of the bears remaining in Valistia, saving his brother from certain death, and helping Jill overcome her trauma, yes, the man deserves this one solemn moment of peace peace and love. He's gone through so much suffering, being unloved by his mother, causing his brother to nearly die, losing his mentor, losing his home. Everything he's had to overcome has been leading to this specific moment. Clive and Jill are just two characters I really like, so to see them admit their love for one another is just so satisfying. Finally, a moment where everybody wins. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. All right, all right, I've done enough gushing. This game is nearly perfect in almost every regard, so let's wrap it up and get out of here. Ultima is the creator of Valisthea. No, seriously. Ultima is one of the few gods who created Valisthea. Originally, it was meant to serve as a land where the gods could be revered. However, as millennia passed, the gods would grow tired and eventually fall into an eternal slumber, only to reawaken when the plight of the blight becomes truly dire. As the last remaining god, Ultima believes it is his mission to reset the world to cleanse it of the blight so they can start anew. He believes he can do this with Clive's power as the vessel of the icons. Yeah, Clive wasn't just picking up all these pieces of the icon for show. Ultima had laid out an entire foundation for Clive to get all these powers, and that's just so cool! 
Valis the Allure tells us that all the icons are in service to Ultima. Eventually, with Clive as the vessel, Ultima would create the ultimate form of Ifrit to reform the world, ridding it of the blight and in turn of all life present. So the reason Clive wields the dominant of Ifrit is because he was essentially prepping it for Ultima at the proper time. How next level is that? There's only one problem. Clive is not going to take this line down. Ultima constantly struggles to whittle down Clive's will as with every defeat, Clive grows stronger to the point where he will eventually defy fate and challenge Ultima at equal footing. So when the time comes, Dion, Joshua, and Clive set forth to the final Mother Crystal to bring an end to Ultima's hold over humanity. And here's where I get to my single criticism of Final Fantasy XVI. Why Jill doesn't go for the final fight is beyond shocking to me. Yeah, in hindsight for what's coming, I totally get it. But come on, this is Clive's love interest. She's already proven herself more than capable in battle. She should be there. If anything, she would help rather than hinder everyone, so I really don't get why she wasn't along for the final ride. You goofed up. Besides that though, yeah, this final sequence is pretty damn hype. It starts off with a quick time event of Dion, Joshua, and Clive essentially combining their attacks while they all talk shit to Ultima. However, Ultima is not too impressed. After nuking Dion and Joshua from existence, the final battle truly begins. The creator versus his vessel, God versus peasant, David versus Goliath. It's just so fucking sick, I seriously can't get over it. From a gameplay perspective, this is no doubt the hardest challenge in the game. Final Fantasy 16 quickly turns into Dark Souls when you're fighting Ultima. He's using arena clearing moves. He's rarely, if ever, waiting between attacks. You're going to need to be on point if you're going to have any chance of defeating Ultima, which was a challenge I was so excited to tackle. Dude, this is like one of the best boss fights in a video game. You have to use everything you've accumulated, multiply it by 10, and just pray that you'll have enough to take Ultima down. Individually, I mean, come on. Sure, I've been doing this the entire video, but just look at this. Once again, this truly is the final fantasy. Fighting the creator of your realm with the entire hope of humanity on your shoulders, right off the back of seeing your brother die in your arms, the stakes are made to be grand, and god damn it, they surpass even that. It's one of my favorite final boss fights ever. Both ideologies going against each other, the visual aesthetic, the music, it's all just perfect. After going nine rounds with Ultima for long enough, Clive eventually comes out the victor in truly the best possible fashion. Eight. It's over! As Ultima lies on the ground defeated, all he wonders is why Clive continues to fight against the struggle. His answer is simple enough. All humanity knows is to fight. When the going gets tough, all the chips stacked against you, all humans know is how to fight. If things aren't the way you want them to be now, you can always fight for what you truly believe in. Working together is the essence of humanity. And as long as we work and fight together, instead of against each other, Clive believes that humanity has a fighting chance. It's for this reason he was willing to risk it all. This right here hit me like a truck. Clive doesn't see himself as the chosen one or anything like that. He sees himself as just a guy fighting for what he believes is right and for what he loves. Doesn't matter if he dies because he knows he's leaving the world in the right hands. All the realm needed was that first push, something Clive happily obliges to. If you're one of those people worried about Final Fantasy 16 not being a true Final Fantasy experience, this ending should dissuade you from any of those thoughts. Final Fantasy games have always had a deeper meaning to them. Seeing as this entry borrows a lot from Western media where that meta is explicitly thrown right at you, the deeper meaning couldn't be simpler. It doesn't matter who or what you are. 
as long as you are willing and capable, you'll always have a place in the world. Overall, the story of Final Fantasy 16 is one of the greatest epics ever told in a video game by all accounts. It has great writing, excellent characters, the realm itself is very interesting, the monsters inhabiting Valisthea are sick, it looks amazing. Just everything is perfect about Final Fantasy's narrative. And normally I transition into a finale where I'd sum up my thoughts on the game in question and end on a nice tagline, but I've pretty much done that already. So I'll say this. Final Fantasy 16 is one of my favorite games of all time, and it's without a shadow of a doubt one of the best games ever made. Square Enix, Yoshi P, Suzuki-san, Soken-san, and everyone else involved, take a bow. You more than deserve it. You did the impossible. You convinced someone as cynical and as skeptical as me to try your latest and greatest, and it turned me into a diehard fan. The gameplay is god-tier. The story is god-tier. The characters are god-tier. The music is god-tier. Just everything involved with this game is peak. It's really as simple as that. If the series was lacking any sort of excitement or life from any of the previous entries, Final Fantasy VI not only sparks interest back to life, but it exceeds all those that came before it. Fuck, this video is around an hour at this point, and I could still talk about so much. There's just so much that's in this game that truly elevates it to another level. It's one of my favorite games of all time, and I never thought I'd say that about Final Fantasy. But you've heard me shill enough throughout this video, so let me end off with this. Play this game. No, this isn't a game review. I'm not gonna score it or any of that nonsense, but just go. Buy a PS5 if you need to, and play Final Fantasy 16. Games like this do not come come very often. Amazing, fast-paced action combat combined with excellent story and presentation. And if video games are trending in a movie-like direction, it's comforting to know that Final Fantasy 16 doesn't shy away from what it actually is. Is it perfect? No, nothing's perfect. But it's in those imperfections where Final Fantasy 16 truly advances the medium to new heights. I'm just lucky I got to be along for the ride. Tell me, what do you imagine will befall this world? Now that you have gained your precious freedom. Tell me something. Why do you not resist? Within you lies the power to slay gods. The phoenix perished in your flames. Yet you do not fight. You do not flee. You refuse your gift. So long, I thought I had all the answers, but then I met you, and if it's an outlaw the world needs to help it break free, I can think of one better than you. That I will be there, no matter what you must become. My sins, my pain. My sorrow. I see now. They are all a part of me. I'll kill you, Westbrook! Come then. Show us the strength of your will. It's not the strength of my will that should worry you, but the weakness of yours. As we watch the world stumble slowly to its dark end, it was here we pledged a new beginning. His power may be absolute, but so is ours. And so will yours be. With my light in your heart, not even a god might stop us. Not need you, you or anyone. And it is they who will give me the strength to end your reign. The world you seek is but a fantasy! The only fantasy here is yours, and we shall be its final witness.